Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this life. Thank you for your presence in our lives. And thank you for the fact that you allow us to be in the fullness of life with you. Now, Father, I pray that you lead us to listen to you, that you open our ears to hear, that you unbind our hearts that move towards our own desires and help us to have a desire that gives us the fullness of life. And that is knowing you and walking and being led by you. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. The gospel for today comes to us from Matthew chapter 13. And it reads this way. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed wheat, weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in the field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done it. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? And he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The devil, the weeds, are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. You know, I started to think about this scripture today, and I, I was transported back, let's say, back to my first home that I really ever remember growing up in. I have sketchy thoughts about the house that we lived in before, but about the age of four, uh, we moved into Island, New Jersey, and we moved into 31 West Francis Street, Island, New Jersey, 08830. It was a, a community, a subdivision had been built right on in Woodbridge Township, but right alongside. If you went up the end of the street, you were in Edison. If you went two blocks the other way, you were in Colonia. And uh, it was a great place to grow up in, actually. It was not, you know, what you'd call upper class. It was middle class to lower class. But we had a lot of friends and a lot of neighbors. I remember my neighbors. The ones to the left of my house were the Silvas. The ones to the right of my house were the Schmitz. The ones across the street were the Coglins and the Lannings. And the one behind me were the Hybels. Well, you know, this was the, really the first time my family ever had a lawn. And I remember early on, and I can't give you the exact date, my father got the idea to get, idea to get a gas-powered lawnmower. They were expensive in those days, and money was tight. And so he went to three of the other neighbors and asked them if they wanted to be part of purchasing a lawnmower that we'd all share. The Schmitz, the Silvas, and the Hybels. He was a little not sure of, you know, how this would work, but he did it nonetheless. Well, it wasn't long after that that, well, the Schmitz kind of decided they wanted to get their own mower. The Silvas decided they wanted to get their own mower. And so it was really just down to the Hybels and us. And every time the Hybels got the lawnmower, I remember my father would grumble. I don't know whether it came back dirty or whether it just didn't work and he always had to work on it or whatever. Finally, he decided he was going to just let them have it. Just get rid of it. 
I remember very clearly her saying, Barbara, the Hybels are going to keep the lawnmower. We'll have to get our own. They were our neighbors, but they weren't what I'd say close neighbors, even though they lived directly behind us. And I think that probably that was signaled to me really clearly when we finally put a fence up around our yard and around the front. The sides, it was four feet, but along the back, it was six feet high, as high as you could get it. You know, I say that because Jesus doesn't talk and use the word neighbor at all in this gospel, but he does talk about things that are in close proximity. The parable he tells of the wheat and the weeds is a quite interesting parable. It basically is trying to describe what the kingdom of God is like, both here on this earth, I believe, but also what's going to happen at the day of reckoning, you know, when everything happens at the end. But he says real clearly that the master, which is, he explains, the son of man, sows good seed, which are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the enemy. The enemy is the devil. And we're told that, you know, the wheat and the weeds, although the weeds were not, in a sense, planted by the Son of Man, they were planted by, in his story, the devil, that when he's asked by the servants, you know, should we rip them up? And he says, no, if you rip them up, you might rip up some of the wheat, and we don't want that. We'll wait until the time of harvest. And then the reapers will come in, and I'll tell them to cut it down, get the weeds first, put them in bundles to be burned, and the wheat will be gathered and stored into our barns. You know, if you look at that, the, the characters in this, we're told, of course, son of man is the master, the owner. We're told that the enemy is the devil. We're told about the children of the enemy and the children of the kingdom. We're told about even the reapers, the angels. But you know, the part that is missing that you don't hear is it says, the servants or the slaves, those words are in sense, doulos in, in Greek, and, and they can mean either way, but they're the ones that brought the attention to the master, to the owner, that the weeds were even there. You don't hear who they are in the explanation of the story that Jesus gives. I've got to believe, because they were servants or slaves, that they are somewhat definitely in the kingdom. They have to be, to be with the Son of Man. But what this story, I think, tells us isn't so much about, you know, how it's all going to work in the end. I think it tells us more about what's going on even right now. You know, there's a book that was written years ago, and I can't remember uh, what the guy's name was, but it was called Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? And maybe Jesus is making an attempt at why things sometimes are difficult in this life. There's an old saying, you know, God is good, life is difficult. Uh, I mean, that, that life is difficult. And why are things sometimes more difficult than they have to be? Why don't they always go smoother? And perhaps the reason is, is because, in a sense, the field is the world. What we live in is broken. And so there's going to be other wheat. There's going to be other weeds. There's going to be children of the kingdom. There will be children that maybe don't want to be part of the kingdom or aren't part of the kingdom. But what does it tell us to do with them? It tells us very clearly that even if they are directly next to us, neighbors, we don't cut them out. We don't rip them up. That it's not our job. It is not our job. That God will take care of that in his due time, but our job is not. I believe, to ever judge, which scripture tells us, and to always, in a sense, love our neighbors. It doesn't say love our neighbors if they're like us. It says love our neighbors, period. We're supposed to be called by God to look out for the people that are planted next to us, even when they appear to be, well, not wheat, but rather sometimes weeds. So how do you do that? Well, I think the first thing you got to do is, is learn how to forgive real easy. 
Because a lot of the times, the things that are going on around us have little to do, in a sense, a cause that maybe even we had done something ourselves, but it's, they are experiences that we have to mold and shape us. I believe that everything in life, whether it's good, bad, difficult, or easy, whatever it is, has been allowed to come into our life so that somehow we can learn from it. That might be really hard to buy if something gets really, really ugly, you know, like abuse or something like that. But I do believe that somehow we can always be moving forward from the place that we're in to a place that, in a sense, as I've said a lot of times, to be a little bit less of what we are right now and a little bit more what we ought to be. But to get there, we have to realize it's not our job to correct them. It's our job to learn everything we can for ourselves and to learn how to forgive. You know, Jesus probably said more than anything else was, I love you and forgive them. On the cross even says, forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgive them. They don't get it. Forgive them. You know, forgive them as many times as it takes. Don't let yourself get hung up. Don't let yourself hold on to stuff. Don't let, in a sense, the people that live next door to you or behind you who have somewhat misused you, perhaps, or things of yours, they perhaps, let it go. And you let it go because it's in letting go of that that you let God in and you don't keep God out. You know, I, I always laugh to myself because, you know, here my dad put up that six foot fence in the back so we never see the highballs again. And I have to be honest with you. I don't really ever remember a conversation with them from the time we put up the fence again. It wasn't that we were, un, you know, unfriendly. Uh, but it was just that, well, they were over there and we were over here. If they had asked for something, I know my dad well enough to know we would have done it. But it was that we needed to keep a boundary between us. You see, when you forgive, that doesn't mean you reconcile and you go back to being best friends and everybody's looking alike and you're singing kumbaya, because it doesn't work that way a lot of times. Forgiveness is an internal transaction that, that happens where you finally say, I'm going to let go of this. It doesn't mean that the other person accepts it or rejects it. It doesn't mean anything about the other person, except that I'm no longer allowing them to take, in a sense, you know, room in my head and my heart without paying rent. You forgive. And some of the people that you got to forgive the most are the people that sometimes that live closest to you. It's also the people, uh, one person in particular called yourself, that you got to forgive. Now, when you do forgive, it doesn't mean you shut them out. But it might mean that you put a boundary up between them. Uh, I've always been of the philosophy that, you know, when I close the door on somebody, I close the screen door and I might lock the screen door, but that doesn't mean I close the inner door. There's only been one or two people in my life that said, no, I got to close both doors. But there's a lot of people in my life that I said, no, I got to close the screen door because I don't want them just walking in on me anymore because it's not good for me and it's not good for them. Jesus is very clear that we are called to do that. I mean, he says in a number of places, in Matthew chapter 18, he says that what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And in John chapter 20, he says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are, for, they are retained. And what he's getting at real clearly in my mind is not that we have the power of God to free the other person, but we do have the ability and the power with inside ourselves to not carry that burden and that resentment and take on stuff that's too much, that is baggage we don't need. You know, the wheat and the weeds grow next to each other. But the weeds don't turn the wheat into weeds. And as much as I'd love to believe it, the weeds don't turn the weeds into wheat. It doesn't work that way. People sometimes are, but, but there's an influence that you can have if you are a wheat living next to weeds. I laugh in this day and age. How many weeds do we have 
that we called weeds in the years past that now we find out, well, wait a second, they have a really good purpose. Maybe they're just a little different than us. Maybe they aren't wheat, but maybe they're oats. I think that's what the scripture gets at more than anything else. For you to hold on to your character, for you to realize that sometimes things don't go your way, and sometimes, well, to tell you the truth, there's people that aren't safe to be around. But that at all times, that the power of God is more powerful than anything that has been placed around you. That the power of God is more loving and will lift you through anything that goes on around you. That the power of God, if you trust, just trust, will lead you so that you will shine by the brightness of the sun. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.